Last week, we read the entire chapter in the sermon entitled, Lost and Found. We read the entire chapter, we covered all three parables, and what a great feast we had at the teaching and the preaching of the word in that. As promised, I have more to speak on the last parable from verse 11 to verse 32. I made that uh, promise last week that I would do that, and I'm going to do that this morning. But just very quickly to recap, we recognize the purpose of the parables, the purpose of the parables of Jesus. I'm not going to go into all the details, lest it take us time this morning. But we recognize in our previous sermons, we laid the foundation for the parables of Jesus, that these parables were stories, were earthly stories with heavenly truth. Earthly illustrations with heavenly truth. Jesus using everyday earthly experiences, everyday earthly illustrations that people knew, that people were familiar with. He drew on those and from those illustrations brought to the disciples a truth that they needed to know. What's important about the parables, and I repeat again on this Lord's Day morning, that Jesus was not telling a story to make it simple for people to understand it. The purpose of the parables is not a story for people to make it simple for people to understand. No, the purpose of the parables was judgment against the people. That the common people, those who were outside of being disciples, would not know what these things meant. And Jesus said as we read from and read and taught from Matthew 13, that these have been given to you to understand, the disciples to understand. They were not for everyone to understand but for the disciples to understand. So the common misunderstanding is that Jesus spoke in a story format so that everybody could understand. That's not true. He spoke only to the disciples in this way so that they might understand. And by doing so, by that decision, it is judgment upon all others who are not his disciples. Now, Last week, we spoke about the sheep that was lost, we spoke about the lost coin, and we spoke about the prodigal son. And in all three, we recognize it is about salvation. The sheep was lost, Jesus goes and recovers it. The coin that's lost, the lady lights the lamp and, and tries to find it. And in, in, in the son, we saw in the, in the last one, the prodigal son, and in all three, in the sheep and in the coin and in the, the sun, we saw the value of the object, the value of the person. The sheep was so valuable that the shepherd left the 99 and went after the one. The coin was so valuable that the women lit the house and looked everywhere for it. And the son so valuable that the father rejoiced that his son had returned. So he spoke about it in the context of the value to the owner. And that how the value to the owner is in such a way, and, and, and your value then to God, that God would do just about what he needed to do to bring you to him. And what did he do? He, he, he gave his son Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the value you are to God from before the foundation of the world. And so we found that to be the case in the two parables, uh, sorry, the, the three parables. In the three parables, we'll, in, in the three parables we said they, they overlap in their meaning and, and their truth, but we identified a difference between the, 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 the first two and the last one. And we said in the first two, the shepherd goes looking for the sheep. In the second one, the woman goes looking for the coin. Both are uh, indications or illustrations or the truth comes out that God will search and find his sheep search and find the lost one. And in the last parable, the father doesn't go looking for the son, but the son comes looking for the father, comes back to the father. And we said that was the difference between the third parable and the first two parables. And we said the way we understand the difference then, does it mean that God doesn't go looking for the son in the third parable? No. We used all three parables together to describe how God works in, in its entirety in salvation. If you want to learn more about that, you can find that sermon online, as you know, and uh, be encouraged and um, be taught on that. So, we recognize here, you come now to verse 11 to verse 32, like I said last week, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I've tried to 
I've battled over the title for the sermon this morning. I was going back and forth, and the guys on the, the, guys on the broadcast team group know I've, I put something there, then I deleted it, and I put another thing there, and I deleted it again. So I wasn't sure about the title of the... And then I said, let me just title it the way I'd like to pray about it. So I've titled it the way I'm praying about it. I've titled it the way I see the text and what I'm praying about. And what I'm praying about is this. As I read this text, as I understand what God is saying through the text, my prayer is, Lord, help me not to be like the older brother. And that's the title this morning. It's not catchy. It's not something you can put on a headline. But it's my prayer. And I pray it is your prayer by the time you come to the benediction today. Lord, help me not to be like the older brother. So let's look at this. What do I mean by this? When I say, Lord, help me not to be like the older brother, why am I saying this? Why title it this way? Well, we're introduced to this family from verse 11. The family is made up of two sons and a father. We don't know of a mother. A, a, a mother is not mentioned in the text. So there's two sons, the younger son and the older son. Verse, verse 11, a man had two sons. And he goes on in the description of their age, one younger, one older, obviously. Uh, and uh, the young one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. So all through the text from verse 11, all the way up until um, um, verse 24, um, we find that the, the story, the, the, the illustration is about the son, the younger son that went out and squandered what the father had given him. And then from verse 25 onwards, we pick up the story and we introduce to the older son now. And obviously the, 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 the difference, it's not, not the difference, the over, overlapping character between the two, the father and the son, oh, sorry, the overlapping character between the young and the older brother is the father. So this is the basic layout of the story. And in this basic layout of the story, Last week, we spoke about how he came, the younger son came to be back with his father. Again, I, I can't repeat this. this. There was too much of things in that sermon, and it doesn't help to repeat it this morning. But you can go back and listen to that, and watch that, and learn from that, and recognize the, the, the aspects of salvation on how God works in salvation. Because we spoke about how he came to his senses. We spoke about how God called him. We spoke about how he ran. We spoke about repentance and all of that and more. But what we, what we recognize even from last week, the bridge also between last week and this week is this great and glorious truth, number one, is that God changed the plans of the younger brother. You see, the plan of the younger brother is this. He says in verse 17 when he comes to his senses, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Now that verse comes under what we call in 2 uh, Corinthians, we look at as, as godly sorrow in repentance. Godly sorrow. He's not somebody who's coming back and saying, well, I know I went away, I made a mistake and you know, yeah, I'm back now. Let me just, have, let me just get what I, well, what I used to have. You know, I just want to come back to normal. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm not worthy anymore. I'd, I'd rather just be happy to be one of your hired men. There's a, there's a godly sorrow in that. And like I said, we covered that last week. And then he, so, he says he, so he says in verse 20, so he got up and came to his father. But while he was still far away, his father saw him and he felt compassion on him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is the plan of the son. As he makes his way to the father, he recognizes what he's done. And in his mind he's saying, I will just be happy just to be a servant. That's his plan. What does God do? God changes his plan. God changes the plan of the young man. God changes his plan. God is sovereign over all. He changes the plan of the young man. God shows him. How we can be reconciled to the father. By bringing forward the father's heart to the sinning son. The layout 
of the story from where it gets a little bit more in depth. Beginning at uh, chapter 15, we last week spoke of an interpretive challenge in chapter 15, verse 1. Let's look at that. Because chapter 15, uh, b b beginning at verse 1, ties up with the end of chapter 15. That is almost a complete circle. There's, a, there's, a, there's the, the, the entirety of the meaning here Jesus brings out. Because he begins with two groups of people in verse 1. It says, now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So the two groups here, are the two, within the two groups, there are other groups. But the two main groups here are the sinners and the Pharisees. The sinners and the Pharisees. Jesus begins with that, highlighting those two groups. And as he progresses through the Psalms, he comes, sorry, as he progresses through the parables, he comes to the end of the parable, the third one, and we can see by the time we come to the end of the third parable who Jesus is talking about and why he begins with the two groups in the beginning. Because he's going to show at the end the two groups are made manifest in the two sons. One is a sinner, the other one is a Pharisee. One is a sinner, the other one behaves like a Pharisee. And that's what we'll see here. The younger son is the sinner, the older son is the Pharisee. Why do we say he's like the Pharisee? Why do we say he's behaving like the Pharisee? Because look at what he says. He's upset from verse 25 all the way to the end. He is upset with uh, his father. And he goes back to the beginning in, in uh, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1 and 2. In verse 2 it says, both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble with Jesus, saying to Jesus, saying, this man eats with sinners. In other words, why are you receiving these people? Jesus, you shouldn't be receiving these people. We as Pharisees know better. You shouldn't be eating with these people. They're sinners. You shouldn't be receiving these people. They're sinners. They're dirty. They're contaminated. They touched unclean things. Don't be near them. So we see here that the Pharisees were upset with Jesus because he sat with sinners. But because, here's the word there in verse 1, and sorry, in verse 2, in, in, in verse 2, this important word, this man receives sinners and eats with them. He is not just talking to them, he's receiving them. And the Pharisees were upset, and this is the problem with the son now, in the third parable. His father is not just talking to the son, the father has received the son. He's brought the son in. And, and the older brother now, he's responding the same way the Pharisees did in verse 1 and 2. He's upset. How can you eat, father? How can you, how can you put a robe on him, father? How can you put a ring on his finger? How can you put sandals on his feet? How can you welcome him to sit at our table, father? How can he eat the same food with us, father? He's upset. Same way the Pharisees were upset with Jesus. And now there are a few reasons why the older brother, just like you and I, behave like Pharisees. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that. There are a few reasons why the older brother, just like you and I, behave like Pharisees. We get upset just like the Pharisees. We do, you and I do. We get upset just like the Pharisees. Why? Why do we get upset? Why do we behave like the older brother? Why do we behave like the Pharisees? Well, number one, we ask the question concerning this, Father, why has the younger son not been checked and double checked that he is in fact changed? You've just received him. He says in verse uh, 21, and the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father doesn't respond. The father responds in this way. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and put sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. The son is saying, hold on. Why haven't you checked and double checked that he's actually repented of his sin? Why haven't you checked that he's let go of that life of prostitutes and, and spending the money? Why haven't you checked and double checked that if he's going to do this again? See, he's upset. 
that his father hasn't checked and double checked. He believes the father has made a mistake here. And it's the, the, the older brother thinks it's up to him now, the older son, to show wisdom here. The older son thinks he's showing wisdom here. He's taking a stand here. He wants to show wisdom here. It says in verse 25, and the older son was in the field and he came up and he approached the house and he heard the music and the dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he began, we go on from verse 27 and they tell him what has happened. And he addresses the father when the father comes out to speak to him. And almost in a sense of exclamation to the father in verse 20, look, for so many years I've been serving you. And he goes on to lecture the father on this. He believes the father has made a mistake here. And it's up to him, the older son, to show wisdom, to show the father the mistake that he's made. Well, that's what he thinks. This is very similar, church, to a conversion that we know of historically, dramatically, in the book of Acts, very similar to a conversion that is profound in redemptive history, the conversion of a persecutor of the church called Saul. I keep your bookmark on the book of Luke, the 15th chapter, and go with me to the right and go and look in the book of Acts and we'll see um, your life and my life, not only in this parable, but in the book of Acts here in the ninth chapter. So in the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, we know from the eighth chapter how Paul was persecuting the church. We know how the church was, 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 was growing. Uh, but look at uh, chapter nine, and Paul, in, from verse one to verse nine, we have the, 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 the dramatic, effectual calling of Saul to be a Christian. Jesus personally appearing to him. It is the personal appearance of Jesus Christ to Paul, to Saul, that qualifies him to be an apostelos, an apostle of God. He's unique and different compared to anyone else in the church. Why? Because he has a personal calling from God like the rest of the disciples. They personally heard Jesus Christ. They personally saw Jesus Christ. Nobody today can be called an apostle in that sense, the way Peter and Paul and the rest of the disciples were apostles. Now, we can go on teaching about that. And if you want to learn more about that, you go and look at our First Corinthians sermon series, and I talk in depth about what it means to be an apostle and how the word apostelos is used. But listen, from verse 1 to verse 9, we find here the, the dramatic conversion of Saul. And then look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Ananias recognizes immediately who's talking to him. He recognizes immediately this is God talking to him. Kurios, kurios here. This is Jesus talking to him. Kurios in the Greek. This is God speaking to him. This is Jesus speaking to him. Now there was a disciple at, at Damascus named Ananias and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. He knows who's talking to him. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might, get, he might regain his sight. But look at Ananias' response. Ananias knows who's talking to him. It's, it's kurios, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. And Jesus tells him what to do in a vision. Gives him an instruction. This is a heavenly instruction, a divine instruction coming to Ananias. Who is Ananias? Ananias is a believer in the Lord. And says there in verse 13, but Ananias, begins with a but. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many I have heard from many about this man and much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority. Um, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Rather than just saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it. What does he do? He answers back. I am not accusing Ananias of being rebellion. I'm not accusing Ananias of being disrespectful. But I am saying that God spoke to Ananias here and told him what to do. But because Ananias knows who Saul is, in Ananias' mind he's thinking, no, it can't be, Lord. It can't be. 
Really? Saul? I, Lord, this man, we know him. He's carrying papers from the chief uh, uh, Pharisees and scribes. He's carrying papers from the Sanhedrin. We know this man. Lord, it can't be him. Surely it can't be him. And that's what they say about the man standing before you. And that's what they say about you. It can't be. We know you to be a sinner. We know you to be a drug addict. We know you to be a murderer. We know you to be a porn addict. We know you to be an adulterer. We know you to be a liar and a thief. We know you to be this, that, and the other. We know you to be an atheist, an agnostic, a Hindu, a Muslim, homosexual, lesbian, whatever it may be. We know you to be that. You cannot be saved. Surely not, Lord. You made a mistake here. This is Ananias' response. This is our response. When we look at people around us, whom the Lord calls to himself, and he puts a robe on them, and he puts a ring on their finger, and he puts a sandals on their feet, and, he, and there's a rejoicing in heaven, a feast in heaven over that one who was a rapist and a murderer and a liar and a thief and an adulterer and a fornicator and a homosexual and a lesbian and a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist, whatever it may be, and they come to Christ, God receives them as he has received you. As he has received me. I remember when I made my first profession of Jesus Christ in the, in the secular world that I lived, that I worked in, in the medical field that I, that I worked in. They said, no way, man, that you can be a Christian. Really? You became a Christian? No way. I speak of how the world responded. But here you have a Christian responding this way. What is he doing? He's trying to remind God of how bad Saul is. He's trying to remind God of how bad Saul is. Beloved in Christ, aren't you thankful this morning that no matter how bad you were in your life, no matter how deep in sin you were, no matter how sunken and stuck you were in the muck and the mire of sin and death, God condescended. God reached down and lifted you up out of the muck and the mire. He saved you by his precious blood, by dying, by hanging upon a cross. And if there be any this morning here in the chapel or watching this by way of the recorded format, no matter how far you are from God, God reaches out to you. He stretches out his hands. He calls you to himself. Jesus says, if any call upon me, I will never reject them. I come to you. I receive you to myself. You can come to Christ today. You can run into his everlasting arms today. You can run into the Father's love today. And he'll embrace you. And yes, you stink of prostitutes and you stink of adultery and fornication and porn addiction and, and murder and, and homosexuality and whatever religion you belong to. You stink of it and yet he puts his arms around you. Like the sun stinks of the swine and the pods that he had been eating. He stinks of the prostitutes that he'd been sleeping with but yet the father puts a ring on his finger and a robe on his back and he falls on his neck and he cries. What does he say? The one who was lost has now been found. The one who is dead has now, is now alive. This is our life in Christ. But you see, this, the, the, the older brother is upset, just like, I'm not saying Ananias is upset here, but I'm drawing the illustration. I'm drawing a comparison here. Look how Ananias responds. This is the way the, the older brother is responding. No, no, we, 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 we know what he's done. We know what he's done. Am I behaving like the older brother? This can potentially be very much like us. I'm not saying it's you. But can it be you? Can it potentially be you? Will you come to a point in your life where you behave like this? If you haven't already done so, will you behave like this? Even if somebody who's done wrong in your life, if somebody's hurt you so much and God saves them, God saves them. Would you be upset? Like Jonah was upset. No, they deserve hell for what they've done. They deserve punishment for what they've done. Don't save them, Lord. Don't bring them into the family. I don't want to sit with them. I don't want to have the Lord's Supper with them. We have a, we have a potential to behave like that. Potential. We, 
want to fact check God as if God doesn't know what he's doing. We want to fact check God as if, as, as, as if God doesn't know who he's brought into the family. And I mean the Christian family, I mean the covenant family. Indeed, God has brought, God, do you not know you brought in an ex-criminal? Do you not know, Lord, you brought in an ex-addict, a robber, a murderer, an adulterer, a fornicator? Lord, you're bringing them into the family? And God says, yes. Why? Because he makes them clean. Like he's made you clean. Like he's made me clean. And the robe signifies the robe of righteousness that he puts upon the son. He says, no longer are you recognized by your filthy robes. But you're seen in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ, the Son. Today, if you're a Christian, there's a robe that has been put on you. It's the righteousness of Christ. That's what God sees. The older brother is saying this also. The reason why he's upset. He's saying this. He's saying these words that you have said. He's saying these words that I have said. Here's the words. What is he saying? Are you ready? It's not fair. The older brother is saying, it's not fair. And we recognize this in the, in, in the text. In the text, Let's go back to the text in, in uh, uh, chapter 15. But he answered and said to his father in verse 29, look, father, look. He said, look. He said, look. It's like he's bringing his father to some sort of attention that the father doesn't know. Look, father, for many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you've never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. Listen, it's unfair. I've been laboring. I've been working. I've been faithful. And you've never given me anything. Not even a young goat. It's not fair. This man who has squandered all the money, who's taken the wealth, who's brought shame to our family, uh, and, and, and has gone and squandered all this thing, he slept with prostitutes. And you welcome him? It's not fair, he says. This is the question we always, or this is the, 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 the point we always make about things. It's not fair, Lord. It's not fair, church. It's not fair. As we talk to people, it's not fair what this person has done or how God's treating that. Why can't God do that for me? It's not fair. Well, this younger sinner comes in at the last minute and gets the prize. He gets the prize. Salvation is his. Let me bring contextually what happened this past week. A very important businessman in India called Ratan Tata, he died. I've been following his story for years. I'm intrigued by his, his business etiquette, his composure when he speaks, and of the wealthy men in the world, he seems to be, in my limited understanding of him, a man who was very humble about the way he went about things. So he died. Ratan Tata, if you don't know him, uh, he's not one of the wealthiest men in India. There are people who are much more wealthier than him. But he's a man who took over Jaguar Land Rover and rescued it in England from going downhill. So Jaguar Land Rover belongs to Ratan Tata Group, or the Tata Group. They own Tetley tea bags, which we use in our homes and in the church and everywhere else. And that's apart from the multiple other businesses that they own across the world. From real estate to mining to steel. I think when the steel mill in Swansea was closing down, it was Ratan Tata who stepped in to take over the steel mill so that um, people wouldn't lose their jobs. So he was a hero to the people in Swansea because a man came in to rescue their jobs. I, I, I think it's Port Talbot, sorry, not uh, Swansea. And so well, I, I could be wrong, well, either one of the places, but you, but, you, but, but you get the story. Here's a man who is greatly respected, and everyone who spoke about him says he was a compassionate human being. Because the man was not selfish. It was a man who gave his money freely to, the, to, to charities and, and to others who were poor. He helped people to come up in life. And he was a, he was a kind man and a, and a gentle man. And as we watch this in our home, the question is asked in our home, well, where is he now? He died, but where is he now? You see, we know the answer to the question. He's in hell. He was a devout Hindu. He's in hell right now without Christ. But the person looking at his epitaph, the person looking at his obituary, will say, you Christians say he's in hell. That's not fair, you say. That's not fair. Look at what he's done. Look at his entire life. Look at how he's given to charity. It's not fair. That's the shout of the unbeliever. It's not fair. 
a man lives with his wife for many years. He's faithful to her. He doesn't look at anybody else. He doesn't have any extramarital relationships. He's faithful to his wife. Him and his wife are devout atheists. But they stay together all of their life. Both of them die. Where do they go? Not to heaven, but to hell. But one may say, that's not fair. Because they lived together. They were faithful to each other. They kept to their marital vows. It's not fair. But yet it is. Compared to who, you say? Well, here is a man who was a rapist. He's in prison right now. And today he prays a prayer. He's on a deathbed and he prays a prayer. And in this prayer, somebody led him to Christ. And he recognizes his sin. And he turns to Christ on his deathbed. And he dies tonight. Or let's say last week. There's Ratan Tata who died. A man who did great things in the world in the sense of business and entrepreneurship and helping people and philanthropy. And then you have a, a, a rapist who on his deathbed confesses Christ. One is in heaven and the other one is not. And the world shouts, that's not fair. That's not fair. Your God is not fair. But I say indeed, my friend, God is fair. Justice has been served. God is just and justice has been served. In what sense? God has sent his son to pay the price for all those who call upon him. The rapist on his deathbed called on Christ. God effectually works salvation for him. And he's in heaven. Ratan Tata did not call upon Christ. Although he did many great things. But the world shouts, that's not fair. And this is how the older son is saying, that's not fair. Why? Because in verse 29, he says, I've labored. I've been working tirelessly. And I get nothing. But look at this father's response. The father is saying, really, this is not true, son. The father is saying, really, this is not true in verse 30. But when, he, when, when the son of yours came, who has devoured wealth and prostitutes, and, and you killed the fattened calf, and he said to his son, he said to his older son, son, you have always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. Son, you're misunderstanding here right now. You're drawing the wrong conclusions. Your heart is not in the right place. But you see, in that statement, we have a sneak preview into the older brother's heart. We have a sneak preview into the older brother's heart. And the older brother's heart is sometimes like our hearts as Christians. You see, we're serving God because we're looking for a reward. That's very much like the older brother. He's serving because he's looking for a reward. Look at what he says. He says, for many years I've been serving you and, you've, and I've never neglected a, a, a command of yours, yet you've never given me a young goat. The young goat, or some of your Bibles might say, I've never given me a kid, which is a young goat. What is he looking for? He's looking for reward. He's saying, all my labor has to account for something. I've got to get something for this. Why haven't I been given this? So that's always been on his mind. He's actually told, he's actually made uh, public, he's told his father what has always been on his heart. This is how he's seen his life. This is how he's seen his service unto the father. And this is very much like you and I today. We serve God because we'd like some kind of reward. And we don't serve God because we love him. Is it true today, my friends, beloved in Christ today, is it possibly you today, you serve God because you want some kind of reward? And that reward could be various things. Some, so many people came to church here, this church, time and time again, this building. Even in the past when we were moving on from place to place, people would come and say to me, can you pray for me that God would bless me? See, that's a reward you're looking for. It's a reward. You, you, there's something people want from God. But you won't hear people say, can you pray for me that I may love him some more? That's a prayer you never hear. Pray that God would give me something. Pray that God would meet some my need of mine. Pray that God would give me some reward now. Something. I ask you today, is it possible? Is it possible today 
in this small congregation? Is it possible to those who are watching by way of the online digital audience? Is it possible today, if you're a Christian, that you're serving God, looking for a reward rather than serving him because you love him? We must make clear our rewards are not here, but in eternity. Now God blesses the faithful. There's no doubt about it. And we see that in the, when, when, when people are obedient to God. He, we, we, we recognize the fruits in the blessing that God brings. But ultimately, our reward is not here. Our reward is in heaven. Our reward is in eternity. Our reward is when we go to meet God face to face. That's the upward call of the prize that, that, that Paul speaks about. That's what we're heading towards. We, we're focusing on that. But you see, the brother here says, Father, you've not given me anything here now. He really wants his father to appreciate him. That's what he wants. He wants his father to appreciate him. Rather than him appreciating his father. It ties up with my previous point. He wants his father to appreciate him rather than him appreciating his father. He could have said to his father, Father, you've taught me something really great here today. Father, what great love you have. Father, what great compassion and mercy and grace you have. What great forgiveness you have. Teach me this. He is, he's, he's at odds with his father. He doesn't appreciate his father. He wants his father to appreciate him by giving him something. Giving him a kid, a young goat. To recognize his service. To recognize his hard labor. To recognize his daily routines. I hit it close today. I, bring it in, I, I want to bring it into the congregation today as if I've not already done that from the, part, from the early part of the sermon. But I'll say it again today. Is it possible that we have some here today, some in our congregation who are thinking just like the older brother? And they're saying, God, can you just appreciate me this morning? Can you just appreciate me this morning? In what way? Lord, I had to get up early this morning to be here. Please just appreciate me that I'm here. Lord, I could have worked today and got double pay, but here I am, Lord. Could you not just appreciate that I'm here today? Now, you're not using those words. See, we're not using those words, but something of those words comes out in our attitude, in our life, in our worship, in our prayers. I could have worked today and got time in a third, double pay, but Lord, here I am. Now, because I'm here, could you, uh, could you appreciate that I'm here at least and bless me with something? Lord, I'm tired. I've had a busy week. I've had a, a tough week, Lord. But Lord, here I am. I've come. I'm sitting in a sermon. I'm listening to a service. I've sung some songs today. Here I am. Would you just appreciate me? Appreciate that I made the effort. You might be sitting and saying, I'm busy, Lord. My, 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 my schedule is so filled. I've got to do so many things, Lord. But here I am, Lord. I've come to church today. I've made it to one service. Here I am. Would you just appreciate that I'm here, Lord? I do this and this and this and this and this. Would you just appreciate? I pray that's not the case. I pray that may never be the case. But in the reality of things, it is the case. It is the case for you as it is the case for me in my own life. We are like the older brother. We want to be appreciated. It's not fair, we say. We should be appreciated. And you say, you say to somebody, you know, like even in the church, why is that brother being blessed? Or why is that family being blessed? And I'm not being blessed. It's not fair, we say. Well, God is fair. God is fair here. Let's move on as we come to the end. I want to bring this to the end. I've got a lot more that I'd like to teach on this, but time is quickly spent. And what else do we hear from the older brother? We hear from the older brother his theology, his understanding of God, the revelation of God to him. This is a theological sermon in the sense that from, from, from verse 25 to um, verse uh, uh, 32, it's, it's packed with theology. It's packed with a, a doctrinal understanding and doctrinal practice. How do we say that? How do we know that? Well, let me just unpack that for you very quickly in the most simplest way. The older brother had, uh, had, had, had no place in his life for grace, for mercy, and for forgiveness. In his understanding, he had no place for grace. He had no place for forgiveness. 
He had no place for mercy. As one pastor rightly said, and I quote, the older brother had no room in his theological world and religious experiences for grace and mercy and forgiveness. Let me repeat that. The older brother had no room in his the theological world and religious experiences for grace and mercy and forgiveness. None. And that shows from verse 25 all the way to verse 32. May it never be said of us, but yet it is a reality within the church worldwide. Not only in our congregation, but in the church worldwide. A very poor understanding in our, own, in our own theological understanding of what forgiveness is and what grace is and what mercy is. I keep your bookmark here on Luke 15. Go with me to the left very quickly. Just one more, one more portion of scripture that I'll turn to. In, in, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 130. In Psalm 130, we look at just two verses here. And uh, <clears throat> in Psalm 130, in, 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 we'll read from verse 1, but I want to focus on verse 3 and 4. Um, Verse 1 says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. And then verse 3, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If you, Lord, could mark iniquities, in other words, if you could be the one taking tally of everything that is sinful in our life, who could stand? I ask you the question today. And we had a discussion, my wife and I, about this yesterday concerning pastors and being above reproach and, and all of that. And I say, not a single person, including our beloved mentor, Pastor MacArthur and others, none of us can stand. Nobody, not the, even the man standing before you. If the Lord took account of everything, if you should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? The answer is very simple, none. The older brother can't stand. That's the point I'm saying. Because in, see, in his understanding, what he's saying is somebody else has done wrong, but I have not done wrong. He doesn't understand grace. He doesn't understand mercy. He doesn't understand forgiveness. Because look, look, at, look at verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Who could stand before God? None. If you marked all the iniquities, none. But he says, but there is forgiveness with God because of forgiveness. We can stand because of his grace and mercy that comes with his forgiveness. We can stand. Amen. Could it be that the older brother himself does not know for himself what mercy and grace and the forgiveness of God is? And I feel that's an important point today. That we ourselves don't know what that is. We ourselves don't experience that. We've not known the saving grace of God. We've not known the mercy of God. We've not known the forgiveness of God. I mean this not just theologically on a piece of paper. I mean it theologically and experientially. I mean it in doctors and doctrine and in practice. You see, we can sing of forgiveness. We can pray about forgiveness. We can speak of the mercy of God. We can talk about the grace of God in amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me, but we could know nothing about it for ourselves. Could it be possible that this brother himself does not know for himself mercy and grace and the forgiveness of God, and that's why he acts the way he acts? Is it possible? That may be true for people within the church in our church and in the church worldwide that, that, that we respond the way we respond as the older brother does because we ourselves don't know what mercy is and what grace is and what forgiveness is. As I come to the end, I'm out of time, so, so quickly out of time, I've got to... I'll skip a few points. Let's get to the father. We've got so much more to talk about the son here, but let's get to the father.
Let's talk about the Father as we conclude. Well, I'll give you just two things about the Father. Number one, from verse 28. From verse 28, but he came, his son makes the case. His son doesn't want to come into the feast. His son wants to stay out in the field. He's standing his position. He's making his case known. He's standing his ground. He refuses to move. But verse 28, but he became angry and was not willing to go in. This is the son. And his father came out and began pleading with him. His father left the feast, left the dancing, left the eating of the food, left the table, got up and went to the angry son, went to the hurting son, went to the son who's upset and saying, this is not fair, went to him. What a marvelous thing this is. He went to him. I say to you, my dear friends today, you that are wayward, this is the lesson for me today. The lesson for me here with the Father. What's the lesson to me as a pastor for you today? In this Father. In this fatherly illustration. In this glorious truth about this man, this Father. About who God is in the Father here. The lesson to me is that the Father went out to the one who is upset and angry and far from the feast. You see, he should be in the feast. He should be with the family. He should be seated at the table. But he's not there. And the lesson should be, should me, for me should be, listen, I'm going to try a little harder. You heard a little bit this morning about some of the frustrations of the journey that I'm on. And some of the decisions that I've been coming to. Why? Because I, I do believe, I do believe even before I preach this text, I believe I was, I had some of the characteristics of this man, this father. I had some of the characteristics where I'm saying, no matter how far you are as the congregation, no matter how far these sheep are from where they should be. And I mean it in the sense of, you, 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 you as a Christian know where you should be. You know what God's called you to be. You know where you should be faithful. But you're not there. You're far from it. It's very haphazard. It's very, it's, you know, the, 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 the worship life is sporadic and it's, it's up and down and all over the place. And I know I have some of these characteristics where the father goes out to the one who's far and I've come out, brothers and sisters in Christ. If there be anyone today who says that I've not done this, I will repent before you. I will repent before the Lord. I have done this. I have, I have come out to where you are. I've made every effort to meet you where you are. In my pastoral care, I've done it. No matter how far you are from the sermons and how far you are from the Lord's Day and how far you are from the, from the, from the temporal Sabbath rest that we were keeping, no matter how far you are from attendance and, and giving financially to the church or whatever it may be, no matter how far you are, I've come to meet you where you are. I've come. Week after week, month after month, year after year, I've come. How have I come? I've come in my pastoral care. I call you, I ask you how you are. I call and I say, we've missed you. We didn't see you. I call and I say, what can we pray for? How can we go forward? I call and I inquire. Secondly, I labor over the text week after week for you. I bring you what I believe to be good food every Sunday to meet you where you are, that you can come, that you can be drawn, that you can come and serve the Lord again for your benefit and for the glory of God. I have set up counseling one-to-one -one apart from the Sunday. I will do all the things on the Sunday. I will do the pastoral care, but yet I will do more. I will set up counseling one-to-one -one with you. I've done that. Not only the counseling one-to-one, -one, but personal teaching with you one-to-one. -one. I've done that. I'll fellowship with you outside of church one-to-one. -one. I've done that. And yet, I look at the text today and I'm convicted that I must continue to do this. I will continue. Because I see the example of the Father here. No matter how far you are, I'm going to come and meet you and say to you, listen, come. Come and sit at the table. Come and be with the rest of the brothers and sisters in Christ. Come and rejoice with the rest. Come and feast with the rest. Come and eat with the rest. And I say, brothers and sisters in Christ, as, the, as the, 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 the son, the father is saying to the son, you're missing out, son. 
You're missing out. Come. That's a lesson to me here from the Father. What's a lesson to you today? The lesson to you from the Father would be this. Kill your pride and come in. Kill your pride and come in. That's what the Father is saying to the Son. The Father comes out to the Son and says, Listen, Son, just come in. Kill the pride and come in. Whatever's holding you back today, oh, I've, I, this, is, this is wrong, that's wrong, whatever the case is, kill the pride and come in. There's a feast. There's a celebration. There's a gathering of the believers. We're crying out unto the Lord. All these things are happening. There's good testimony and witness of lives being changed by the preaching of the gospel and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the discipleship of his word that's coming out. Brothers and sisters in Christ are rejoicing over how much they're learning. You're missing out. You're standing on the outside. And you're looking in, and you hear the music, and you see the singing, and you hear the celebration, and you don't want to come in. I say, my friends, today, don't be like the elder brother. The father comes out to you and says, son, kill the pride and come in. Today, I say, kill the pride and come in. For you too, my dear friend today, are much in need of the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God. You see, when we stand as the older brother and we look out across the other person and says, oh, he is, in, he is wrong and he has done this and he slept with the prostitutes, we come from a place of not recognizing that we are indeed that person except we've committed a different sin. We've committed a different sin. For this person, it might be sleeping with prostitutes. The son is right to say he slept with prostitutes. And the older brother hasn't slept with prostitutes. But the older brother is still wrong in his sin. At the end of the day, the younger brother has slept with prostitutes. That's his sin. But the older brother has his sin too. Maybe his sin hasn't been shown openly. The lesson for the older brother should be what I said, a lesson from the older brother, should be what I said about a preacher who died last week. It was a preacher from South Africa, his name is Ray McCauley, he was a product of Rayma Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I, I don't support them, but I know of him, because you know I grew up in Pentecostalism. So I know of him, he's a very famous preacher in South Africa, and he died last week. He had one of the biggest churches in South Africa, he was a trendsetter. His music we played in our homes from their church. Our children grew up with their music. Their music wasn't heresy. It was some of the things that shaped our theology. And we can compare and contrast now our life in, in singing compared to them. So I, I'm not rejecting everything he taught. And people ask me to comment on his death. And I wrote an article, a short article about his death. And I said the things that he had done wrong. And I said the things that he had done right. And I said I truly believe this man knew salvation. No matter what he's done, I said he knew salvation. And I ended it this way. I ended my article this way. I said, and I quote, our epitaphs should read as follows. Here lies the mortal remains of a man who tried to please God every day, but fell short of God every day. He therefore threw himself on the altar of God's mercy and God's grace. End quote. I wrote that about him because I wrote that about my own life. I fall short of God's glory every day. Though I'm trying to please God, and we said this in the, in the, in the Puritans reading last week for the Sabbath rest, and you heard it this morning, I'm trying to do what is right, but I'm failing. See, that's the position we need to hold as I bring the sermon to an end. That's the position we need to hold. I'm trying to do what is right, and I'm failing. God help me, revisit me again with your mercy and your grace and your loving kindness. George Whitfield said this. He says, the arms of Jesus lie wide open. His loving heart um, streams with love uh, flow from him. And he bids a hearty welcome to every soul that is seeking happiness in God. Is that you today? As you bring this to a conclusion, I make an altar call this morning. Not that you would put your hand up. 
I'm not asking you to put your hand up. I'm saying in your own self, in your inner man, would you put your hand up in your inner man and say, this is me, I am the one who's like the older brother. I am the one who's like him saying, this is not fair. Would you pray for me? Would, you, would God heal me today? Would God deliver me today? Would you raise your hand from the inner man? I don't want to see your hand raised, literally. But I'm making an altar call this morning. Would you run to God? Would you run to the Father and say, Father, forgive me for my attitude. If you're sitting here this morning, or you're watching by way of the broadcast, and you're soaked in sin, and you're smelling of the sin of the world, and you're trapped in the muck and the mire of the pigsty, and you're eating the squalor of pigs. In other words, you, 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 you're feasting at the table of sin. And you hear this sermon this morning. You hear the Father calling you this morning. You see the Father in the distance and you run to Him. You come to your senses this morning and you run to the Father. And the Father is calling out unto you and He draws you to Him. Run to Him today. But you will say, I'm not clean. And you'll say, I stink of the world. And you'll say, I've done this and I've done that and the other, done the other. I say, run to God, my dear friend. Run to God. Run to God. Run with the stink. Run with the stench. Run, run with your clothes drenched with the mud of sin. Run with the stains of, this, of, of, of the immorality of the world upon your life. Run to Him. And fall upon His grace and His mercy. And ask him to forgive you. And he will wash you. And he will cleanse you. And he will make you as white as snow. That can be your blessing today. That can be your life today. And this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.